Day night. Welcome, everybody. Second week, but first real week. Awesomeo.com, live before lock. PGA show. Myself, Ben Raza, here with Jason Roslin. Sony Open, full field. Uh, Josh is teaching me new things behind the glass and YouTube. We're discovering new things. What's going on? Are you ready to go here? Yeah, um, me too. I mean, it, I had no idea that you could mute a specific tab of the 9,000 tabs that you know, we have open at one given time. Great to know. Thanks, Josh, uh, for that. And uh, thanks to thanks to Fantasy Draft for keeping on putting on golf contests. I mean, last week it wasn't that bad, right? No, not at all, man. They're sticking with us, as I always say at the top of the show. We do appreciate them sponsoring the show. And as you guys know, uh, you know, a DFS player can lose up to 30% of their bankroll due to rake. Fantasy Draft has solved that. Uh, that's a massive number. 100% of the entry fees are paid out to the winners 100% of the time over there which just means more money in everyone's balance. As simple as that. If you haven't signed up, use the referral code AWESOMO. You get a seven-day free trial. Go check it out. We're going to be talking about Fantasy Draft. We're going to be talking about all the sites. Pretty good contests across the board this week. Uh, We've got some win to talk about. We're going to get there. It's kind of absurd. And we'll dive into some other things. We have some fun things to do with chat. We see you guys in there. Uh, What's going on, everybody? Yeah, should be should be a fun week, and uh, I'll start off the the DK contest. Just one thing that I noticed this week, and it's the first week I've noticed it, so I thought I'd bring it up. The nine dollars slant that they've been running for uh, football, they've put out the golf version of that now. It's a it's a two min cash or two x min cash. It's called the slice. Um, yeah, all slice things, yeah. Uh, I think it's 45K guaranteed this week for 5K to first, which is not great, but uh, if you like that type of contest, certainly. Um, I expect uh, some some people to be playing in this week, but yeah, we're in we're in Honolulu, just outside of Waikiki Beach, uh, Wailea Country Club. You're gonna hear a couple of different pronunciations this week. Uh, Wailea, Wailele. I mean, I've heard them all, um, and I guess none of them are really wrong, right? Because the Hawaiians have their own way of saying it. Yeah, you're not gonna hear any from me. I just call it the Sony Open. <laughs> I don't mess around with stuff like that. That's too. Too much oil. Uh, Yeah, too crazy, but we are still in Hawaii. We saw the tournament last week. This is now a full field. So right off the bat, I know we have some uh, new folks. We got Keith, first time playing DFS golf. Well, strap. Welcome. Um, We've got the uh, Bachelorette. I wish she was here. That would make the show a lot more interesting, (laughs) but that's neither here nor there. We do have a full field, though. So if you're unfamiliar, that means after Friday, we're going to have a massive cut. Guys are going home. So we, re- you know, the goal is six to six right off the bat. I think we all know that uh, we got to try to find a way to get them through. It's going to be low. I-, I think that's fair assessment. Wouldn't you assume six to six pretty low this week? Yeah. Especially when you see JT at 12 K. And I think that's a, a great way to kind of start off talking. He's in a class of his own. And in the pre notes that I sent to Ben, I paired up a lot of guys on a one-offs because I think a lot of those conversations will have to happen this week, but JT's in a class of his own. However, if you go 12K here, you're going to be forced into guys like, you know, Sung Kang, Nate Lashley, which may not be terrible. Um, but I found myself being able to build a really good, solid, balanced lineup, or at least that's what I think right now, sitting here. Um, and JT has shown in the past that he's not great in the wind. I mean, I can tell you, I know firsthand at the British Open a couple of years ago, day two was terrible, and he went from four under to out of this tournament, uh, missed the cut. So, a little nervous about his win game. Um, he's obviously come a long way. What say you about JT at 12 and then throw the conditions in? So, I mean, when you have wind like this, it just ups the variance. If he gets, say he gets the worst of it, that could be, you know, a couple shots here and there. That can make the difference. Uh, we're talking about 36 holes when you're talking about a cut line. A couple bad bounces. I mean, that happens to everyone throughout the year. But when you're talking about, chalk when you're talking about high you know high-end guys that are 12k um north of 18 on fantasy draft i'm not saying i'm going away from justin thomas i certainly have some exposure but i I did build pretty balanced uh right now looking at my exposures i haven't finished building yet but i I have you know around 30 percent jt but he's not in my main lineup he's not my cash lineup right now uh which i'm actually rather surprised i thought he would be yeah, it's uh, again. I found it tough that 12k price tag. Um, I appreciate that you know DK put it out there. Now you throw in the wind, like you said, it's going to add the variance, and then throw on top that 
we've got him projected to be the highest owned guy over at Osmo. We just released the ownership uh, just a little while ago. We're looking at somewhere around 30%. Now I've got maybe a little bit lower, but by any stretch, I'd go with the Osmo guys, as you guys see on the screen. This is just mine, which I average in. Well, Osmo is in my projection. Again, 10 out of 10 times, I'm going to go with theirs. It's just something I put out early on in the week to, for a guide. Um, in any case, does that even make you more inclined to want to fade him? So, yeah, I mean, I talked about this, you know, Jason, I know you and me were in chat uh, a couple of days ago and we had a couple of questions about something from last week. And we were talking about on a non-cut, not to say that you can't go full fade and not to say you can't be aggressive, but even if you get a guy right, you have to survive it for four days. Whereas here, if you really make a stand, if you come in underweight on a chalk guy, if he starts slow, if you get it right, they're eliminated after Friday. That is such a huge advantage. Uh, you get paid off much faster and, you know, to a higher degree in full field cut events. So that always has me a little more incentivized to make a stand here and there and say, I'm going to roll the dice and hope this guy does get cut. Next, number two on the board, while we're talking about ownership, is uh, Webb Simpson. So the top two guys are our top two projected owned. Definitely makes for a really variance and interesting slate because you know you're going to have to get some cheap guys in there if you're putting in a 12 or an 11 one. But to me, Webb Simpson and Pat Reed are very comparable here. And again, I definitely don't want to put both in the lineup. It, it just kills the salary. So we, you, you can tell me about each of them, I guess, but I had written down, it's probably one or the other here um, or neither. Uh, or did you pick either of those options? I did actually. Uh, and I went with Patrick Reed, who, if you know me, that's probably where you assume I'd go. Um, now I, I don't want to draw too much, but he putted the lights out. There's no doubt about it. He gained over nine strokes putting last week. That's what saved him. But Patrick Reed is a guy who's shown time and time again, he can get it done. Uh, not with pure ball striking. He's a scrambler. He's a, a gritty guy with the short game. Um, and, you know, Webb is, he's fantastic. There's no doubt about it. I think he has a very high floor relative. I know we're talking about golf here, but to me, he was actually up top, a guy that I left out. I either went to JT or I bumped down to a more balanced build. So not only did Patrick Reed putt really well, which he did, but he also, around the green, was so fantastic. I mean, he ranked 28th in scrambling last year on tour, but he gained just about three strokes around the greens last week, but it gave him the opportunity every single time to make a big par putt, make a big birdie putt. Um, obviously, it may have failed him on the third playoff hole there when he was in front of the green. But still, um, if if this is a windy event and guys are going to miss more greens, there are a select few that you would say, you know what, I want my guy. I'll be okay with my guy missing the green. Patrick Reed, Jordan Speed, those are two of the guys that obviously we talk about a lot when we're talking about around the green. So definitely, definitely think that Patrick Reed's in play here. Do you think that Webb Simpson – is the reason why you're going with Reed over Simpson just because he played last week or is it a little bit more for you? I mean, that certainly factors into it. Uh, you know, to me, I, I think Webb just kind of fell in a situation where every time I looked at him on a certain lineup, there was a guy that I felt better with, whether it's JT just for overall, JT's just better. Um, and then with Reed and Decky, to me, I do have their win equity, their top five equity ahead of Webb this week. Um, so he didn't really fit. He was almost like a fringe cash play. If he was cheaper, I would have used him in a balanced build, but he was so expensive that I honestly didn't even feel the need to, to start with him in cash, even though I do get the merit in doing that. So starting in cash for me, um, which uh, I'm sure at this point, you know, I don't play too much cash. So it's pretty much who I started most of my lineups with, um, was Colin Morikawa. I'm, a, I'm, I'm nervous because we have no idea what he's going to do. We haven't seen these type of conditions in him playing them, right? He's no. too new. But last week, he he looked really good. One of my things that I liked about him last week was he gained just about 3.5 strokes, just over three and a half strokes off the tee for the week. But he also was fourth in driving accuracy. So not only was he hitting it far and putting himself in good positions where he was gaining strokes on the field, but he was also hitting the fairway a ton. So, you know, Vice versa, you look at Cameron Champ last week, also gained similar strokes off the tee and came in almost last in uh, in fairway percentage hits. So I think that Morikawa's game could translate here. Again, the wind is going to be a big factor. Um, I started here. I went with Morikawa over Matsuyama, which is really scary to me because 
Matsuyama has been around for so long and is, and is so good. Um, what say you in that matchup? Or did you go one or the other or did you skip this range because you went Patrick Reed? So I did go Patrick Reed more often than not, but I, I went Deki over Morikawa uh, in life. I actually have that head-to-head. And, it, and it's for what you talked about. And truth be told, we're going to find out. I'm trying to infer this. Morikawa has literally answered every challenge. He got a little, you know, a little burnt out, I think, during the FedEx Cup after a super impressive year. But yep. the guy's just been fantastic. There's no doubt about it. I don't know how he's going to react to – I mean, this is wind – I want to be clear. We talk on the show all the time. It changes. But this is wind. It's not a window. It's just supposed to be windy literally for days. So I don't know how they missed this up. Yeah, and not just and not just wind, right? We're not just talking 15, 20. We're talking 25 to 30, maybe even 35 sustained. Gus going even higher than that. This is some real wind. I The first two days, I wouldn't be surprised to see a four over par cut. If you remember the Honda massacre, uh, as as we termed it, I believe it was two years ago, um, where there was just absolute carnage. The course was playing ridiculously hard, and there was a bunch of win factor, 25 all the time. I believe the the cut was something like three or four over. We could have that again this week, which is Good. which just makes it crazy. Just, yeah, I, just I like that. Bring it on. Total carnage. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So as we as we move down, that second guy in the lineup, this is where it gets interesting. To me, I went right to Sung Jam. I'm just going to play him until he wins. You and me both. Yeah. Um, he is someone unlike Morikawa, and I, not to pick on him because he's fantastic. Yeah. Sung Jam, I think, is apt to handle literally anything. Calm yeah. conditions, great. Horrible conditions, that's fine. He can do it all. His game is so well rounded. Uh, he fits any type of build. Uh, one of the easiest guys, I think, to click in any lineup. So, did you play him over Neiman? I did, especially yeah. in cash. I don't think that's particularly close. I, I think Neiman is fine. If you want to lean on more aggressive driver stacks, I think he makes actually a lot of sense. But he is someone scrambling. If there's more scrambling than usual. Uh, Give me some jail all day long, yeah. Was, yeah. Neiman also was – I mean, the President's Cup did not do him any favors. I, I know you got some experience there, but times were tough. What can I say for my Chilean man? Yeah, I mean, and again, a great showing last week. He showed us – Great shot making ability, which you know I love to see that. I love to see a player that knows how to make his way around a golf course. Again, those fairways were nine thousand yards wide, so he could do that type of stuff. Um, a little nervous about this this week. It's not the same at Wailea. Uh, it, it, not even close. It's tree lined. It's in a valley. Um, it's it's relatively flat. So we'll see if it translates. I'll take Sung J M there um, almost every time. So and again, these are just. One-offs, when I was building lineups prior, I came into these situations a lot. That's why I'm asking you um, th- this way. The next one, though, I had was, was Matt Kuchar. He's kind of an, on an island for me. I, I said to you, I don't think I'm going to play him above 8,500, and here he is at 99, and I can't click the name. I, I just can't. So the, the one thing you can say about Kuchar is you're going to get leverage. He's going to be lost there. Yep. People want to go all the way up, as we certainly mentioned. People like Sanjay, Neiman, Leishman, CH, all these guys are going to garner ownership. Kucher, probably the low man up there. Uh, I think there's a reason why I don't like the spot for him either. Just kind of, he doesn't do much for me. And at this type of price, I really am not too incentivized. Even if he comes in, he seems like the number four. He's, it seems like he comes in 14th, just looking at his past results <laughs> every week. Like, even though that's okay, that's not exactly what you're looking for. Upside really hasn't been there. If he was eighty five hundred, I'd be like, actually, you know what? That that's okay. Uh, in in my four, you know, in a four hundred dollar lineup, I'll take a fourteenth out of my eighty four hundred guy. That's fine. But he's ninety nine hundred. You know, top five guy on the board. If you're going to put him in your lineup, you hope he's going to get a top five or win. Of course, he did that last year, um, but he's nowhere near the type of form that he was in last year coming in. So uh, definitely take note of that. Uh, next two guys are two guys with really decent course history. I won't say great course history, but rather pretty good. They haven't missed a cut either of them. And I think the last combined like 10 or 11, maybe even 12 tries it's Mark Leishman and Charles Howell. Obviously if, if we're Sung Jay is almost like a, you know, a pretty much automatic click. We want to pick one of those top five guys. We're just skipping both of these altogether. I found myself getting to Leishman in a balance build um, where I didn't have more. Yeah. I have some Leishman. Um, you know, it's a guy that again, he can play in wind. He's Australian. He's got experience. He can play in the wind. 
He can kind of fit different builds. He was a little banged up. You know, he had the back issues. I couldn't get him right last year, but honestly, I'm just kind of willing to long-term. I know he's a good player. I know he's live to do damage. He has good Bermuda splits. I'm going to kind of roll with it, even though you are flying a bit blind with where he's exactly at. Yeah. I, and I made the same decision you did there. I, I, as good in Charles Howell, don't get me wrong. You know, Charles Howell, I believe has the most top 25s here. Uh, yeah, there you go right there. He has five tw- top 25 since 2013 to Leishman's uh, four. It, they're really close if, if that's the barometer we're looking at. And obviously the, the odds makers and DraftKings put them really close together as well. So um, that's a situation because it's a, a direct one-off. Maybe I would play the other one and bet the other one. Um, but uh, it, it, that, was a, that was a tough one. The next two guys are Abraham Manser and Corey Connors are on the board. Two interesting plays. Corey Connors has gotten talked up quite a bit um, around the industry. Obviously his Tita Green game or more, more ball striking game is good. I think that might get mitigated a bit. And Abraham answer is so much better of a putter. I went answer if I had that, I, if I had this decision. So did I, um, you know, Corey Connors, again, he is a fantastic ball striker, but I kind of am worried about that prototype in this conditions. I don't know if you're going to be able to see guys rely on pure ball striking and just be bad everywhere else. And he's done that time and time again, he gains like eight strokes with the approach, doesn't scramble not a great putter uh i don't think that's going to work here then you look at answer i'm interested to see where he comes in ownership wise just because so many people saw him absolutely do everything and then some at the president's cup uh and that's really you know in the swing season he was fantastic eighth at mayakoba fourth at the wgc so he is coming in pretty hot yeah sure is um playing in the wind to who knows everybody's got to do it so um We'll definitely see with him. The next guy that I have highlighted on the screen over here is Brant Snedeker. And he's got the stigma of being one of the best win players. And and uh, I brought this up in chat earlier and, and somebody made a great point. He had that great round at the Farmers where he just blew the field away. He had to deal with some of the conditions, but not all of the conditions that day. So the stigma of him being so much better in the win than everybody is probably a little bit overblown because of that. However, there's a reason why he is good in the win. It's because obviously he doesn't drive the ball far to begin with. So he's obviously not hitting it that high and he's so good on and around the green. So Brent Snedeker, for me, he's a GPP play. Um, he was able, I, I snuck him in on a, on a higher dollar on FanDuel. Uh, but for me, DraftKings GPP looks like he'll be under 10%. So I think I can get good leverage there. Same. Uh, he's got a guy. He, I always think he's, a good win equity type play. He's a winner. Um, this is a guy that he can get crazy hot with the putter. Not a good driver of the ball, but you know, he knows what he's doing. Conditions like this, I think do help him. It is overblown. There's no doubt about it, but I don't think it's going to really affect his ownership. The guy I want to ask you about real quick though. I know we're moving down right above him is Kisner. Hmm. What do you make of him? He's someone that I do have interest in another good putter, uh, But at the same time, he didn't scream value at the price tag. Yeah, struggled with the putter last week, which says to me that can't happen again, right? I mean, if we go look uh, at his his stats this year, I mean, how many times is he going to lose back-to-back rounds? It doesn't look like many um, all year. So with that being said, game looks to be in form. He was gaining strokes on the approach and around the green last week against a really strong field. I'm not really endorsing or going for – I'll just ask you if if salary isn't a problem, I've got the 300 bucks and I only get Kisner or Reevee, I'm, I'll take Kisner. Um, oh, yeah. Are you you there with me? You're out of here with Chess. Get out of here. Get out of here. Done. All right. I uh, mean, uh, so I would rather take a fly. Talk about egregious. I would rather take a flyer on Cameron Smith than play Chess. Yeah, okay. I can buy that. Um, I was looking at him earlier. He did have a decent Australian – Oh, but he had two bad rounds and two good rounds there. So, okay, I can buy that. Yeah. Um, two favorites of, of ours, one of yours, one of mine, at the low 8Ks, Poston and Putnam. So two Ps as well. Um, your guy Poston, another decent week last week uh, with the putter, good around the green as well. Maybe struggle with the irons and off the tee a little bit. If you had to pick one, you'd probably pick Poston here, right? I would. Um, he needs to pick it up a little. I know he's not a notorious, like, great ball striker. He does do a lot 
with the short game, but you can't lose both off the tee and approach. It's got to be one or the other. Um, so I do hope that picks up. If it doesn't, it's going to be a problem. I still would lean to him. Putnam is your account. You every week say to play him. I say that's interesting. Then I don't play him. And then he's good. Uh, are you playing him here? Honestly, they're so similar in types of players. When they you are. look at their stats and, and how they get it done, they get it done with getting hot one week with the irons and making all their putts still because they're, they're both very good putters. Um, I don't mind stacking them both because if that style of golfer is going to be good in the conditions, they likely both play well. They likely both have a chance come the end of the weekend. So I don't mind running them both in the same lineup. I know that's a really balanced build, but you could probably still get in Sung Jay and another guy in the 9K, maybe a Morikawa um, or Matsuyama if you want to go lower. But yeah, I like both. I played both. Um, one of them got the 400 and one of them got the $200 lineup. So yeah, I, I like both this week. There we go. Um, all right. Next guy who I also like, uh, Sebastian Munoz. Are you going back to him this week? Ooh, he's, he's tough for me. He's, he's on the fringe. So Brian Harmon is in the Ooh. same range. Uh, that is a guy that I bet I have a betting article posted. Uh, if you haven't read that, go and read it. I got some real shady business in there. But Brian Harmon, I think, sets up fantastic. He's someone, don't mind the conditions, can get hot with the putter. Not going to, you know, off the tee is not a huge part of his game. So this course should set up well. He has good course history, but it doesn't jump off the page either, which I kind of like. Uh, but, you know, four to top 20s, a fourth in 2018, a couple pair of 13ths. Uh, this guy can play. It's a great course for him. Price is more than reasonable. Yeah, one of my faves, and we saw at the RSM, you know, him pretty much gain every, everywhere, you know, gain a stroke on the field. Looks like he got that consistency back. Um, I know it looks like he missed the cut at the Houston maybe, but still, I see a lot of green on my board. That's what we like to see. I don't mind Harmon. Uh, I guess if I had an opportunity to pick Harmon Poston or Putnam or Munez, and I only got one, that would be a tough one for me. Um I'll say this about Sebastian Munoz. He lost 1.35 off the on the approaches last week, right? But if you dig in, two of those strokes, two full strokes came on the 18th hole on, I believe it was Friday, where he duck hooked two into the native area. Wow. A, yeah, he took a triple on it. So just so those two penalty strokes alone added up to, I believe, very close to two strokes gained. So he raced that hole, and now he's positive for the week and likely ties with, like, Lanto Griffin for a tie for 13th. That number looks really good, putted well. I'm back in. I'm going to overlook that 18th hole, kind of exit out of it and uh, and say that he's got a good bounce back. He came in 10th year last year and it's only start. So that's – yeah. I guess that's where I'd go. No, I mean, there there is something to that. We talk about that during the Florida swing when you have water – like, when you have hazards that are straight penalties – it does up the variance in the strokes gain data because one Munoz right before that hole, he doubled, he shot five over in the last two holes. Yeah. Um, not to say those holes don't count, but it, to me, it's different than a slow death where you're just like making, you know, nine yeah. bogeys throughout the randomly and sporadically, and you're just not doing much. So I, the, it's more of an opportunity cost for me. I like a lot of guys in the next range uh, that are right below him. So it's just tough for me to get there. For sure. So uh, the next range, what we start off with our, our next segment, it's just a, a way to talk about some of our plays in this range or talk about some of the interesting players. Uh, we call it a make the cut segment where we'll first say if we're thinking of the player is going to make the cut and then we'll talk a little bit about the player and such. So first guy I'm going to ask you about, hasn't missed the cut in seven starts since the military tribute? Russell Knox, is he going to see the weekend, the Scottish boy who's Grown up playing in it, or is he going to be heading home on the red eye? <laughs> oh, boy. I think he can weasel through. Um, <laughs> you know, th this is a range, though, again, you know, you, you just have so many names that I, I think you can look to. I, I did separate it a little by tee time, tried to get some correlation with those stacks. Uh, you know, you've got guys like Aaron Weiser there, Fratelli, a lot of names. Um, what do you make of that next range that we're really looking at here? Yeah, so Fratelli was the one on my list. I'm out. I think he misses the cut this week. I Yeah, I think he's back in his bags. Here's the thing. Last week, it looked bad everywhere. And I'm just nervous that when he goes on this 
gets bad everywhere run, it all kind of goes. You see this Wyndham to BMW stretch where kind of everything was bad. Um, I'm a little nervous that we're in one of those. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to be out. The 48 and a half points last week, as you can see here, that that really scares me. Um, so I'm going to say he misses. How about Rory Sabatini, the Slovakian? Well, Grio is the same price, so I certainly have more. Yeah, he was next. I was I was saving him. What can you say, man? Um, you know, Sabs is someone – he was on such a ridiculous stretch. I do think there will be some cash interest from people because he's still making cuts. But I – I will say his swing season cooled down. Um, You know, those string of like top 20s, top 15s started to become top 30s, top 50s, fine in the weekend and falling. Um, Strokes gained have dissipated just a bit. So, yeah, I get it. But, you know, there are just other guys, whether it's Aaron Wise, Grio, Lanto's there, Ryan Palmer is there. We have a lot of names in the upper sevens this week. Grio hasn't missed a cut here. Um so I'm guessing you think Sabatini's gonna pack his bags maybe this time. I yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say not that I'm gonna go out on a limb. I don't think it's yeah. it's a coin toss X type guy. I think he it does uh, miss the cut. Does Grio see the weekend? He well, hasn't seen the weekend. Yeah, he's, he's never not seen the weekend here. I I'm gonna try. It's amazing. This could only last one week. I'm gonna go in with an optimistic approach on Grio. I'm not going crazy. I want to be clear. This is a guy we know he struggles immensely, immensely on the greens. Uh, We know he's a very pure ball striker. And I've preached that I do worry about that type of player in this spot. Uh, And at times his short game has been not just egregious putting. It's been egregious everything. So I do worry about that a little bit. Having said that, I will back him in this spot. I do think he can get through. Yeah, it it just seems like – when you look at his stats, I mean, around the green game got better in the fall swing. I know the putting didn't, but maybe the birdie putts that everyone else is going to be putting par on, he'll he'll miss his birdie putt and have a tap in par, whereas a lot of people will be putting for bar and maybe they'll tap in bogey. So maybe he'll maybe he'll play the exact same and have the wind not bother him and putt the same. And if he does that, he'll easily get through the weekend and he may even be in the top twenty five. At 7,600, you are hoping for a top 20 or top 25. Um, so, yeah, I think he can squeak in there. I need to see – I mean, look at this. I need to see, like, matching the field before I'm ready to give him a top 10, right? It, it, it's – and maybe maybe it comes this week because we know when it does come, it probably likely ends in a top 10 or better. Yeah, it, it, it has been bad. Um, you know, Grio went from a guy who he wasn't getting it done. He was striking it great, losing strokes on the green, kind of like Benny on. It's coming in 23rd, 18th, 9th, stuff like that. Then it started to drop. He has done nothing in the last, you know, you look at August, September, October. He, he was not good. There's no doubt about it. But this is still someone um, that I am willing to, to see what's up. There are options if you don't want to go there. I mentioned Ryan Palmer I like quite a bit. Uh, and the guys that you mentioned right above him are certainly in play, and I have exposure to them. So we talked on the show last week um, about Lanto Griffin a little bit. He was 6,500, uh, and we both said, yeah, maybe he was set up for a little bit of a regression, but he came out firing, and he looked real decent, tee to green. Um, notoriously a pretty good putter and actually struggled with a putter. Do uh, you have interest in him this week? Who, who did you say? I'm sorry. Lanto. Yeah, Lanto Griffin. Oh, Lanto. Yeah, so no wonder I blacked that. My mind, I've trained it to just ignore. Just ignore Lanto. Lanto. <laughs> you know, this is a guy that I hate. Guys like this frustrate me so much because he was just doing it. He couldn't miss with the putter. He was unstoppable. Now he's like ball striking like a wizard. And he, he actually lost strokes putting last week, gained three and a half with the approach. So I don't know what to make of him. He's really gaining everywhere. It's hard not to say you can kind of go there when you're playing like that it seems like a pretty well-rounded game at this point yeah i'm i'm definitely interested it seems like this is the type of it's kind of fitting in in like the style of player of of poston and putnam yeah. and, and those kind of guys that are just solidly getting it done in ways that we don't think they normally would um all right i got the most interesting discussion i think of this range has got to be the 33rd or 30th now ranked golfer in the world, Shugo Imahara. You boy. Uh, My boy Shugo has not 
has not missed the cut in I don't even know when, but he has like 10 start or 15 starts since the WGC, which is on your board here. 10 of them have been in the top 10. I mean, it's insane. It's uh, granted he's playing on the Japan tour, but you know, he had an event where he won and he went out and beat Colin Morikawa and the alike. He's two for two here. Yeah, I'm in. I'm going to, I'm going to, if it's a sucker play, then I'm going to get the sucker play, but I'm in. Yeah, I have trouble. I, I firmly have trouble with guys like this because I look at them and most of the events I see them at, they get cut. Why? Those are majors. So then you see him in Japan and he's dominating. Both of those things are extremes. In major fields, he's overmatched and he's overqualified in the, on the Japanese tour. This is a perfect event for him to kind of show where he's really at. It's a great litmus test. As you mentioned, the last two years, he's represented just fine here. Uh, the strokes gain data has been uneventful, doesn't jump, jump off the page. Uh, if he was a little cheaper, I would have a lot more interest. I don't mind it. I will say that. I warmed up to it a bit, but man, am I going to get myself into trouble with Daniel Berger at the same price? Yeah, I, I did see you write up uh, Danny Berger. Um, Your mortal and, enemy. Yeah, my my chest. Mortal, Jesus. Um, it all stems back to the, the U.S. Open. That's where really the hatred really started when he got himself back in that golf tournament. Um, though I should feel the same way about Tony Finau because it was literally the exact same scenario where Finau got back in it. Anyways, um, course history looks good. Recent form looks decent except for Houston. Um, the only thing I'll say is Matt Jones is sitting at the same price and we just saw him win five weeks ago or, or actually $100 cheaper. So I'm, I'm struggling between those two. If I'm playing two in this range with Shugo, I went to Matt Jones in this scenario, probably because Berger's my mortal enemy. Um, but maybe I'm harping on the fact that he did win that Australian Open five weeks ago and, and maybe similar type of conditions. So, no, and again, listen, there, there are plays down here. We're not into the egregious depths yet. Nope. Uh, what did it for me really is, you know, he's won St. Jude's twice, Berger. That's a similar course in my book. Honda is a very similar course in my book. He lost in a playoff there. Granted, that was multiple years ago when I think he was a much different player. I'm hoping he can return to that form. Uh, I don't know if this really comps to Travelers, even though I kept getting into the weeds there for some reason. I can't really think of why this would, but that's neither here nor there. That's when Spieth beat him with the hole out from the bunker. Oh, man, um, I loved it. But regardless, I do think a uh, par 70 type track is where Berger can excel, and this is that. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Uh, we know that the strength of his game is, is making those clutch putts, getting hot with the approach and putting himself in position, um, off of the team, maybe not necessarily distance, but definitely putting himself in the position. All right. As we, we move down, I, I've actually got a bunch of more names here to talk about. And I don't know if you saw the screen who I just popped up, but our, maybe I, I'm going to call this guy, our nemesis. I think he really is. I'm talking about Kyle Stanley. Oh. Hasn't missed the cut here in four years. Seven K. This is the this is normally the range where we love to uh, to press. Uh, what say you about Kyle Stanley? Yeah, I mean he's he's someone that just uh, you know he takes food out of my mouth. I, I like him. I root for him. He's just a very expensive guy to root for. I, I rarely, if ever, get him right. Kyle Stanley is someone though. You know, me and Tim talked about this yesterday. I know he struggled, but the irons are turned around. Uh, he was on fire yeah. through the swing season. If you go yeah. back into the second half of last year, he gained consistently T to green. The putter was bad. Uh -huh. We know that. But he's trending upward, and I, I actually feel very comfortable going to him even in windy conditions. Yeah, a little nervous maybe around the green. He just had a bad RSM. But if you go look at the breadth of his around the green work, it's by and large, it's pretty decent. So um, no real issues with Kyle Stanley. He burned us so many times last year that I'm a little maybe nervous to, to go back to him, but uh, I'll probably will in, in a, a decent amount of circumstances. How about uh, Joel Daman? Um, saw score over 100 points two starts ago. Um, kind of just comes out of nowhere from time to time, which to me, and you and I have kind of talked about this a lot, it just says GPP to play to me. Yeah, I mean, he can – Maybe he won't feel the wind with his gigantic hat. Um, I don't know. It, you got Russell Henley right there. This is where I really open it up. You know, when I, when I pictured how my lineups and the ones I've built, uh, I got to this range and I kind of – I really did open it up. We have Kyle Stanley. You have Henley. You have Dahman. 
Um, you have Bud Cauley for me. I had a tough time really prioritizing, so I, I kind of mixed and matched. We know that the strength of his game is ball striking. It is not scrambling. So that's another guy you're going to have to weigh with. If you think it's going to be really brutal, I certainly would bump Domin down. Yeah, um, he can get hot and cold with pretty much every club, as you can see on the, the right-hand screen. I mean, that's just the style of his game. Probably why he's priced at, at the 7K. Uh, how about Ryan Armour, who decent fall, really struggled with his putter. He's uh, he's a CBD USA uh, guy now. That's what he's getting into. Tita Green looked really decent over the fall swing. You know, five out of the – let's see, I got here. What do I got? I got uh, four out of five events where he gained at least three strokes, Tita Green, so – not bad form for, for armor. No, he's going to be another guy who I think is cash viable, uh, pretty low variance. He kind of just does what he does. He's not going to wow you off the tee. He, he, like Vaughn Taylor, um, kind of just That's does another good thing. one, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the ceiling can be somewhat capped in certain areas, but if you're just looking for a stable guy in lineups, uh, you could do a lot worse than that at that price tag. Okay. Um, Bud Cauley ha- is one of the only – Two golfers in the field who have started here at least three times and have not found the weekend. Does that trend continue this week? It, it better not. Um, no, it doesn't continue. We got we got to turn that around for Bud Cauley. Uh, you know, it's it's something where I really look and I think to myself, okay, why? That's the first thing you got to ask yourself when you see yeah. course history: is why is this happening? I don't really know with Bud Coley. I think this course sets up well. Now, if you look at the ball striking, it's bad. But a lot of those results were a long time ago. We're talking five, six years. 17, 14, 13. And he's a much different golfer now. So I take that certainly with a grain of salt. And you can argue where his game is at. But I'm not going to read too much into it. And when I think about the ownership vacuum, if people are just looking at course history, you can you can get over with a guy like Bud Coley, uh with minimal exposure. Yeah, maybe projected somewhere in the the low, low five to four, three percent. So you're going ten or fifteen percent, and you're definitely getting two, three, four X there. So um good call. Another guy that popped up a bunch over the fall, but since we're on bad course history, I, I thought I'd get your take here. This one is a little bit more extensive in terms of terribleness. Troy Merritt has played this course six times has missed the cut five and has no top 25s all since 2014. I mean, that's, that's crazy. What do you make of that? Cause he's definitely a better golfer than that. Or so we think. Yeah, that, I mean, that starts to get into a somewhat meaningful sample size. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have a ton of interest in Troy Merritt to begin with, to be honest, he is pretty cheap, but I don't, you know, I don't know what to make of that. Obviously it seems like there is something there. But then you look at his splits and really, you know, Bermuda checks out. He doesn't mind the wind. Not that it's always windy here, but uh, I think that's kind of just, you know, if you really liked him, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fade him just because of that. But if, if you're not really looking to get to him, I certainly am not going to move exposure to him having seen that. Um, I do want to say real quick though, I know we're rolling through some guys. Yeah. We got some good things going on and it's coming to the end. So I just want to make people aware. We have a couple of really good promos running right now. Uh, they, they've been in Slack. You may have heard about them. I'm going to run down them real quick. We have PGA 2020, all one word. And that is a dollar weekly pass to the golf content. Um, if you want to try it out, if you're new, we'd love to have you in there. Uh, you know, you get the projections, you get the stack tools, Jason and me in Slack, all that good stuff. Uh, and then we have just the word 2020. That is our 20 days of Awesome Plus Platinum for just $20. Uh, it ends on January 10th. So if you wanted to sign up, you get 20 days worth of Awesome Plus for only 20 bucks. Uh, all the sports, again, projections, ownership, rankings, lineup builder, all, all the useful tools behind the paywall. You get in here for a really good price. And if you want the whole enchilada, we got a, a promo code New Year, all one word, and that's 20% off Awesome Plus Platinum Yearly Pass, $200 off. You get everything for a year. You're in. You get in Slack. You get everything rolling. Um, we'd love to have you as part of the community, certainly in some capacity. So if you guys haven't done that, you want to get in, get in there. If you have any questions, we of course can help. Um, and then before we get right back, Jason, I, yeah. I had a real two things. One yeah. friend of the show, Shane Smith, super sharp guy. He was saying, you know, armor is one of the lowest ball flights. I wanted to ask you about that. Cause you're a golfer. I'm certainly not. 
do you look at like things like apex height or even ball flight in general with the wind this week? So I remember this conversation, uh, remember what a, a PGA tour pro said to me about it. And he said simply, and being a golfer, I totally, totally agree with what he's saying. The best players can flight their ball any way they want to. If they want to hit it as high as the sky, they can. If they want to keep a Gary Woodland stinger in the bag, they can as well. So with that being said, I think the elite have the ability to control their ball flight. Some elite players better than others can do that. Um, we haven't quite seen Justin Thomas do it yet. We know Patrick Reed can do it. That's He prides himself on shot making. So with that being said, I don't really look at apex height because – in most normal tournaments, Rory McIlroy is probably trying to hit it as high as he possibly can. But if Rory was playing this week, I guarantee you he would be hitting the ball off of his back foot a lot more. Because in, in the golf swing, when you're trying to hit a lower shot, you just change the, the ball position. That's one way to do it, and that's how most of the pros do it. You just change the ball position from the driver backwards. It just goes from, if you're a righty, it just goes from your left to your right. And, and so they would start a lot of their shots off on their right foot to try and create that angle to keep it lower. They know how to do this. If I'm, a, I'm not even close to a scratch golfer anymore and know how to do this, these guys do. So I, I, I never look at apex height, and I, I don't think I will, honestly. Um, if Though, however, we know, like somebody just said, Ryan Armour has one of the lowest ball flights on tour. That definitely will help him because his, his distance off the tee will be somewhat – it won't be mitigated – as much as some of these guys like Keith Mitchell, who I know hit 330 in the air. That's not going to happen this week. Well, it could on some holes if it's downwind, I should say. Yeah, downwind, <laughs> Into the wind, they won't be able to do that. I'm with you. I don't, I don't get too into it. Like anything, even with wind specialists, if it's something extreme, I'll take note of it. If it's all noise in the middle, it may be in like a tiebreaker situation. Uh, I don't really get too crazy in that. We did have one more and then we can get egregious if you want to. Yeah. Um, and this is a good question. I, I know we, we love, I love when Chad asks questions like this because I think people want to know things. Uh, do, I might be butchering this name. I think it's Dope Heathen, but it says, would it be better to enter three lines and a three max at $1 each or 20 lines and like a quarter arcade? So basically, how would you go about that? I know it's somewhat of a loaded question, but I always like talking contest selection. I think it's one of the underutilized things across the industry that people don't talk about. Um, do you have any thoughts on kind of where you'd allocate that, whether you go to 20 or three? Oh, man, that's a tough one. I think in this field for this tournament, I would want 20. For the Masters, I, I probably want three because I know there's only 90 guys, but I, I – I think that for the Masters, if, if you go three and you convince yourself on those three lineups of one against the grain play or two against the grain play, so you can get a ton of leverage. But in a field like this that's more wide open, especially in that middle pack, and because there's so much variance with the wind, I would want 20 lineups to spread it out. But at the Masters, and I, and I hate to say just the Masters, but for me, maybe in a no cut as well, I would probably just rather have those three lineups. Um, certainly some contrary points to that, but that's what I would choose in this instance. I think, yeah, I, I do think it depends on a lot of things. One, what do you think your strengths are? If you think you're better uh, building more of a portfolio and you want 5% intervals on your guys, certainly 20 lineups is going to be for you. If you think that you're more better in a cash environment, if you're better in smaller field tournaments, I would you know, advocate for a three, three max. For me, it would certainly be a three max. That is my strength. A single bullet is really, I think, my best strength in like a 200 man. If I could envision, uh, you know, what I would need to play for something really important, that's the structure I would want. S certainly other people, I know you, you know, you excel really having a portfolio where you can take some stabs and things of that. So I just try, try to identify mix and match um, and see what's what. It does depend week to week too. High variance tournaments, I would want more entries generally. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Uh, I think just for this week uh, with, and, and I hate that we don't have an answer that's a little bit maybe more standardized, I guess. Um, but it that's the thing about D DFS golf, right, is that it, there is so much more variance uh, compared, I, I think, in on a week-to-week -week basis since there's so much changing. So 
Um, great question, though. We've got a few more, and, and I love these ones uh, uh, from our, our Slack chat. We've got two of our guys. Uh, we got Coolers and, and Shock asking us some great GPP questions. Um, I'm going to force you to tell me two guys that you are definitely rostering. I'm going to take out Kyle Stanley because you already told me about him. But Nick Taylor, Brian Gay, Patty Perez, Nate Lashley, Adam Long, and Bryce Garnett. Ooh, all right. That's the first set. I got a second set, but I'm going to go in sets here. I like it. Um, so out of that list, yeah, we'll take Kyle Stanley out. So we've got – I'm just going to say him one more time. we got Nick Taylor, Bryce Garnett, Brian Gay, Pat Perez, Nasty Nate Lashley, and Adam Long. Uh, for me, Brian Gay would be the next guy. Great putter. Don't think the wind – you know, the wind's not going to affect him. Similar to the armor, yep. Yeah, similar to armor. I, I don't love the play, to be honest, but I think he fits certain builds – especially where I'm going, sometimes putter heavy. As a flyer, I'm going to stick with Adam Long. Um, People tried to jump on last week because we only had 34 guys. He didn't do much. Nothing really sticks out. But this is just a guy I I really think is high variance. Uh, He's not going to be owned at all. And the list that Coolers gave us, which I do love, is pretty egregious. I really don't like those names. Do you have any interest in those guys? Who would you pick if you had to force a couple in? Okay, if I had to force a couple in, um, Patty Perez, maybe one. He can get really hot around the green. He's one of those, you know, old, old vets that should probably be able to figure out the ball flight scenario and how to play in these conditions. I don't like playing him, though. He's one of my least favorite players to play um, and maybe one of my least favorite on tour. I just didn't have a good altercation with his wife out at the TOC. So I got a bad, I got a bad stigma. I didn't have it. My wife did. They were in line for food. I'll tell you the story another time. But um, regardless, uh, I don't like him because of that. There we go. However, in, in certain situations, I do like. Uh, I do think he's a fine play. In that list, maybe him. Let's talk about Bryce Garnett for for one second. He he's a guy that won't miss many fairways. His off the tee numbers have been fantastic. In fact, he hasn't lost off the tee since RBC Canada, um, and that covers like 10 events if you guys are looking at my screen. So I love that type of consistency off the tee from someone 7K. He doesn't hit it long, finds a bunch of fairways. So maybe Bryce Garnett, I'm going back to Sung Kang at that same price. I know he's not on that list, but that I do have Bryce Garnett in a couple of lineups, but more often I went Sung Kang. That's fair. I mean, this is where – at this point in your roster, it's more about that you probably got to JT. Maybe you paired up Decky and Reed. Maybe you used Webb and Lee. Like, the only reason you're down here is trying to find someone to make a cut. Uh, you have guys like Chris Kirk. You have guys, in my opinion, Harry Higgs, who I don't mind going to for the bottom. Now, if we need to get lower than that, I see we have a second list. Yeah, this list is oh. amazing. I might play everybody on this list because it, it, it's just so well put together. Um, I'm going to start off with a guy that I have played and I'm not going to lie. I have played a decent amount and it's Doug Gim. And the one good finish he has on PGA tour on the PGA tour was similar conditions at the farmer's open. It was just so tough when was blowing. So it's Doug Gim, Kramer Hickok. Then, then we get, then we get real egregious. I love it. Matt Neesmith, Patty Rogers, Andrew Landry, and Jay, Jay Spawn. I love these names. Um, Andrew Landry, J.J. Spawn, Doug Gim might be the three shortest guys on tour, not in terms of driving distance, like an actual height. So I don't know if we're going for, for that angle. Matthew Neesmith is in Patrick Rogers, not so much. But, um, yeah, are you playing any? Can you get to any? We'll Boy, start with that. I'm not sure. So Andrew Landry, and I'm talking – this is a one percenter. The one thing I will say about him, in between what is a lot of miscuts – it seems like when you get him right, you really get paid off. Just looking at his recent results, he has six missed cuts, and his finishes around those missed cuts are third, 19th, 30th, and 23rd. Pretty decent, you know, when you're considering, uh, you know, in terms of placement. Points. Like, this is a guy that's not coming in 55th when he makes it. it. He seems to be able to get in contention, but the stability, the missed cut equity is gigantic. Uh, yeah. It's pretty bad. Did one of tournament a couple of years ago, the Valero with that Corey Connors one this past year. So yeah, he's the price now at this point at 6,300 for both Gim and Landry. I mean, I'll probably take Gim over Landry just because I, I, 
I like Gim, I guess, more. Um, we haven't seen Gim enough to know he's not going to translate onto the PGA Tour, so um, maybe that's a, a reason. How about one more egregious name? Is this guy Cameron Davis ever going to make a cut on the PGA Tour again? So Cameron Davis left my bankroll and his soul in that bunker when he moved the cut line. That defines just everything from last year. This is a, a, an Australian that I, I was really excited to play a lot, and it's just not clicking right now. Um, I thought his off the tee game was supposed to carry him. It has been sporadic at best. The rest of his game is just not good. Like Cameron Davis, not there. But I'm going to give you, because chat kind of teed it up, okay. uh, who is the made-up player play of the week so it has to be a made-up player oh, yes 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 all right i got it oh yeah i definitely got it definitely got it it's toku toku shimi okay well that's that is a made-up person no, so no, I no, no, no. hold on hold on i got it i got it oh here it is roy kuyu tokimatsu that's there you go there's your made-up play of the week he's ranked 150th in the world but he's got like four top tens in his last six starts on the japanese tour so yeah, you, you like go. to get you you go Way off the reservation. Yeah, that's Okimatsu. That's um, I don't know who that is. I got one more too, but go, yeah, I got one more. This this one's a real one, but you, you go first though. Okay, so there is a guy named Reen Gibson. He's an Australian. He's made some cuts. Yeah. Uh, the off the tee game has really been holding him back. The irons haven't been great either, but he's he's very good in the sh- with his short game. He's got some experience, more experience than you would think. Uh, having played on the PGA Tour relative to being an unknown. He is 6,100 on DraftKings. I don't know how often I'll need to go to the flat min or, or around it, but I do have some exposure to this guy. Uh, I think if you're looking for a true one percenter, and that's all this is, that is as egregious as I go. Not bad. I mean, a couple times over 75 points in his last three starts, uh, as you can see on the board here, so we like all that. Um, all right, the one made-up name. Because he already changed his name already. Since he got on tour, he already changed his name. Great. And when I say change his name, he didn't really change it, but he changed the spelling of the way he wants it look, which means I had to go back and change his name in all the databases. And it was William Gordon when he top 10 and now it's just Will Gordon. This is the kid out of Wake Forest that um, got incredibly hot. Eight strokes gain on his approaches at the RSM. Finished in 10th, gets in the field here because of that this week. Uh, he had had a start before that at the Sanders. He missed the cut. Um, but a really big-time prospect out of Wake Forest. He was top 10 amateur in the world. We'll see if he translates. But obviously, one more top 10, and he's got a Corn Ferry final status at the end of the year. So these starts mean a lot to him. And, and especially if he can get another good one, he probably finds himself getting a few sponsors exemptions. So Will Gordon is my Brendan Wu type of play of the week. Okay. One or two percent ownership. I'm going to get there in the five dollar, probably ten percent, somewhere in that range. No, I like it. It's good to at least be aware of these guys, even if it's to put it in the memory bank. He comes from you know Wake Forest. It's the uh, Bill Haas lineage, so yeah, you know is. you know I condone all things Demon Deacons. Uh, Absolutely. All right, we didn't do it because it was a non-cut. Yeah, it is the first hot take of the year. We are going to start it out good. Uh, we let's hit the ground running. We both got to try to go one and zero here as chat knows we each are going to give a hot take at the end of the year. We, we haven't done it this week, but we're going to do some fun things around it. We'll do some giveaways and things. It's just, we're getting things off the ground, but we're going to have a lot coming. Uh, again, if you guys haven't signed up, we would love you to be in there. And if, if you can hit the like button, we really do appreciate it. Uh, we love bringing the show to you guys. You guys have fun with it. We have fun with it now that you guys are in here. Um, do you want me to go first? How do you want to, how do you want to lead off the year? With the hot takes. Oh, man. Um, Tiger wins two majors. That is that is steaming. See, Chad? I lo- see, I love that. I mean, I would I would probably – I don't even know that I would need to watch golf anymore if that happens. Cause I won't be able to because I'll be – He gets the no- – right. Well, that, yeah, that might be might be true if, if you're fading him. He, all he needs is two, right? Is that, isn't that it? Or does he need four? No, maybe he needs four. I'm sorry. He needs yeah, four. I think he needs four. I think he, he's, he's – He's going to pass Snead if he didn't already, but, you know, for the wins. But, yeah, for majors, I think he needs four. Is your hot take revolved around Harry Higgs? Uh, you know, it was going to be. No yeah, I had a feeling. I was going to go for Harry Higgs top five. I thought that was, like, hot, Ooh. but not crazy hot. Whoa. Um, 
you know, because of the win factor here, I really think it, it levels the field if you can control your emotions. And I think that Will Gordon is playing with absolutely nothing to lose. I think he gets another start out of it. I think we see him go to the desert next week. Not, we'll see him probably not make the cut there um, after another top 10, but yeah, I got a top 10 on Will Gordon. I think it's somewhere like 20 to one on the market. So that might be something I, I throw a little, you know, throw a little dollar on. A little, little change on never, little, never hurt anybody. Um, wow. Okay. I like it. That is good stuff. Uh, I do want to say really, really quick though. Final thoughts on this tournament. I know we have a lot of new people and I think it's awesome. I'm so excited that you're there. Just remember, I say this and I'm going to be saying it on shows or often in the early season, it's like 50 weeks. There's a lot of golf. You're going to have weeks that are crazy. You're going to have weeks with wind. You're going to have weeks where guys withdraw. Just pace yourself. Um, You know, try to some things out, see what's what, but it's a frustrating game. You're going to see guys miss cuts. And then the next week, they're going to look like the best player in the world. Uh, You know, try to stick to a process. Certainly, I hope you lean on the tools that we provide uh, over at the site. And we'll try to get through it together. But early season golf can be really frustrating. Uh, just keep that in mind when you're building this week. Definitely. And, and just a real quick note on the building. I saw a question about randomness uh, for this specific sure. tournament. I've, I feel like a couple of questions. So I've, I pull up the fantasy puncher on the board. First of all, just really quick. I use the normal distribution randomness that they came out with. Uh, that's a, the pro feature over here through Osmo and fantasy cruncher um, for this tournament. First of all, you have to click that one, of course. I'm going to use 25% and I'm going to really focus on the groups here. I'm going to make my core. I'm going to want probably every lineup to have either Sung JM or Colin Morikawa. I'm going to really use that. And then I'm also going to use that secondary core of golfers that Ben and I talked about. Sebastian Munoz for me, you know, that kind of range. I'm going to make sure that I get at least two or three of those guys in each lineup. I'm going to really use that groups feature. It's very, very simple to do that. All you got to do, of course, you know, let's just type in Morikawa. Hey, Graham McDowell popped up. I saw some guys counting him this week while I'm doing that. Any interest? Uh, you know, I, I get it because he's actually been playing a lot better than I thought. I stumbled upon that last week just because yeah. it was only 34 four guys and his swing season was good. He played good last week. He loves, I mean, if a tournament's like five under winner, that screams Graham McDowell style. So I don't mind that at all. So I added in Patrick Reed just because I, I know that you're you're really high on him. This is where I would say, okay, these are the three guys I want to jam in there. I want to have in. I would do at least two in a lot of builds and see what I'm getting. So that's how I would use it. And then since I know I'm getting two of my main guys, I'm okay with that 25% randomness because I don't want to stray too far uh, from my my projections that I'm loading. So that's what I would do there, just a quick little tutorial. And, of course, if you want to join us um, on the Awesome uh, Plus side, uh, we've got a first round leader contest to go through our Twitter to check that out. If you're great at picking first round leaders, you get to join Ben and I for the entire year. So go check that out on our Twitter page and follow a couple of directions there. But yeah. other than that, um, 12, 10 lock time, Eastern standard time tomorrow afternoon. We get prime time. Golf doesn't come on until six 30. So we're going to have to really, really sweat those first, first uh, round of golfers, those first wave. It's, it's going to be brutal, but, um, Ben, I, I look forward to seeing you in the sweat, man. It's going to be fun. But uh, thanks again, everyone, for watching. We will be back next week. And, and stay tuned. We have a lot of things coming up. We're going to have some fun with this show. We're going to have some giveaways and have some good time. So good luck, everyone. And we will be back next Wednesday with another tournament over at awesomeo.com.